Good afternoon, everybody. This is the, the drainage standards and updates portion of your design update training. I'm Rick Renna. I have with me Katie Breland and Rick Jenkins from the central office drainage staff. Um, hope you all had a, have had a nice lunch and are ready for some interesting things from drainage. Okay, get this thing to work. Oh, space bar. There we go. Okay. Well, so, so what what happened in 2014? Well, in the world of drainage, uh, we have uh, been working on some hydroplaning guidance. Uh, for those of you who have been working with design build firms uh, or receiving plans from design build firms, you know that it is really big. Uh, instead of sloping the additional widening to the inside, to slope it to the outside, you you omit um, the, the the shoulder rocking. You omit the drainage system in the middle. Um, big cost saver, but the question was always, well, on these wide typical sections, uh, will there be a hydroplaning uh, potential? Uh, what's the risk of hydroplaning? How does it compare uh, to, the, to the benefit of, of uh, eliminating the system in the middle? So, so we've been working on uh, the, the part of the analysis that predicts the risk of hydroplaning. Uh, Katie will talk to you in a little bit about that. Uh, you'll still be going through the same basic uh, benefit cost with, with uh, extra sections beyond the typical sections provided in the PPM. Um, but the basic engine that, that identifies risk of hydroplaning has gone through some improvements. I think you'll like it. Uh, we'll be talking about some drainage manual updates. Uh, as you know, in July 2013, Index 205 came into Appendix E, and the reason for that was that the cover height tables in Index 205, the pipe cover height tables, were written to, to designers, specifically to drainage designers, and not to contractors. And the department is migrating uh, designer-focused language out of the standard index to where the standard index speaks to contractors. So. Uh, as part of that, we moved Index 205 into Appendix E of the Drainage Manual, and now we have updated Appendix E with LRFD pipe cover. Uh, LRFD uh, pipe cover, the structural analysis, uh, was mandated by FHWA for implementation, and Florida is simply complying. And with that, of course, a new culvert service life estimator. And Rick Jenkins will be talking to you about that. Um, very interesting. I, I think it's a, it certainly is a, is a step up, um, and uh, you'll get to see some of that. Okay, Katie, tell us about the hydroplaning. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've been working hard to develop the new hydroplaning guidance procedure, as Rick mentioned, uh, to help designers analyze wide lane sections and to identify the hydroplaning risk that uh, or the hydroplaning potential that could occur. Now, this guidance takes into account a couple of new things that are pretty cool. Uh, we looked at some of the lesser rain events, uh, the one and the two inch rain events, in addition to the previously studied three and four inch events. So we have a wider range of, uh, of events that we've been looking at. We've also incorporated research from the UCF driving simulator, as well as some field data from Florida's interstate system. So we have a pretty good idea now of how drivers are responding during different rain events. The simulator uh, looked at different folks of all ages, different genders, put in different rainfall intensities, and you got to see kind of how drivers reacted. And so we've incorpor incorporated that into the procedure. It's also, the hydroplaning guidance procedure is also easier to use now. This information is easier to analyze using a new computer program called HP. Now this pro program lets you input and manipulate different typical sections or different lane sections, and lets you assess where your hydroplaning potential could occur takes into account different pavement types, pavement temperatures, analyzes water film thickness and with a variety of ways, and also analyzes your hydroplaning speed uh, using a variety of equations. Yeah, one of the interesting things that we, we saw from the field data, we always thought that the folks in, in South Florida really went fast. Well, well we actually have recorded uh, uh, average speeds, and, uh, and all, of our, all of our suspicions were concerned, uh, I mean, were, were confirmed and our concerns there too. Uh, but it, it was interesting how fast people are really going. Um, uh, just just everything we always thought was, is true. So we are really close to releasing all this information. We will be releasing it in a bulletin form probably mid-February. 
This will include uh, the pretty much the guidance procedure will become a new section in the PPM. So it'll just the bulletin will describe that language. We will also be releasing new PPM typical sections, and these sections are will be available for use without having to go through the variance process. So that's something new and uh, and pretty cool. We will be also working on a webinar where we'll step through the entire procedure. We'll work through a couple examples. We will um, show folks how to use the HP computer program and how to run different different sections. And that'll be coming hopefully uh, by the end of February, right after the bulletin release. So be on the lookout for that. We will also be talking about this topic in much more detail at the expo in June. So we'll be working on that presentation and we'll have some, some good examples for you guys down there. Um, and for those who are working on current projects and you, you may have a, a burning hydroplaning question that you want answered before the bulletin release, we, we're available to help. Just contact your district drainage engineer and, and get in contact with the right folks and we can step you through the process and help on any current projects that, uh, that are needed. Great, thanks Katie. Now the webinar will be part of the series that, that Jackie regularly does, um, I guess, as part of the academy. So, so look for that announcement as part of uh, Jackie's regular announcements, and you'll see this coming up uh, late February, early March, and in, in that range somewhere. Okay, that's great, Katie. Thank you very much. Um, the some interesting drainage manual updates, and not all of them. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just talk to you all about the the ones that that are more significant. Uh, all the drainage updates are listed in the transmittal memo on the drainage website along with the 2014 uh, drainage manual release. So, so there's more that got changed than, than what I'm going to tell you about, um, but this is the more weightier matters. First of all, section 1.5 is a list of drainage report contents, things like ICPR diagrams, storm sewer printouts, uh, kind of a common sense list of what one would expect in a drainage report. Uh, we've, we've typically told our, our drainage designers to think on paper. Uh, we, want, we want criteria there. We want um, you know, everything that you went through to get a finished drainage design. We want that to be, be preserved for the next uh, generation of hydraulic engineers, including options and considerations that perhaps you rejected. Uh, that can even become immediately important in, in that a contractor may propose a change uh, and, and perhaps you looked at that in design and rejected it, but if you don't document it, uh, it would not be the first time that, that something changed in construction that perhaps we had thought shouldn't happen in design. Uh, unfortunately, those things happen, but if we document our, our decision-making process, including uh, decisions that we reject, um, our, our chances of communicating uh, for those down, downstream in time uh, certainly help. Uh, we, we, had a, we added a section on, on judgment for shoulder gutters. You know shoulder gutters required on the high side of, of a super elevation because there is some pavement uh, sloping away. Uh, and, and sometimes that shoulder gutter isn't needed. Uh, just like all drainage, there's, it, it, there's a subjectivity to it. Uh, we, we don't want autopilot design, especially in something that involves judgment like drainage. If you have a slope that you feel is uh, erosion resistant, or perhaps even has a history of uh, not having problems, uh, discuss that with the district drainage engineer. Uh, he or she will, will confirm or, or uh, reject your, your consideration. Um, but we simply don't want to do uh, kind of a default design. Uh, we, we want to think about what we're doing. We want to be frugal uh, with, with our state dollars. And uh, uh, again, go to, go to your district drainage engineer uh, with, with your thoughts. We clarified the section on manhole access. Uh, it, was, it was written to suggest that a 90 degree intersection required a manhole. And, and we all know that Anytime there's a, a, a bend, horizontal or vertical, where debris could hang up or a pipe size changes, uh, we, we always want to be able to get in there and, uh, and, and, and get, get any snag debris out. And, and so this, this was added uh, because we got some pushback on somebody who, who wanted to cut a corner 
um, bluntly. And so, uh, you know, please let's 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 do what we know is right. We we know as hydraulic designers that we need a maintainable system, and we need access when we have vents. We added some guidance on what to do when you're expecting internal pipe pressures greater than five psi. Now, five psi works well for Florida as a shallow burial state. Uh, we don't have the deep burial pipes typically as we would up north, the big hydraulic heads. And, and so there's guidance in there on, on ensuring that you call for a higher rated uh, pressure, pressure joint. Uh, many of the pipes meet this already, um, but we, we did not want a situation uh, where we expected something in the field that, that wasn't accounted for in design. Typical places you would run into a, a more of a PSI, a higher PSI, would be if you had a vertical drain, especially if there was a large bridge collection system coming down to a vertical drain. Uh, you could you could easily have greater than than five psi. Five psi I think is about 11 feet in head. You can you can do the math. Um, but but especially if um, if if you're inclined to to bolt down the manhole uh, uh, lids. Uh, which we do oftentimes when we expect a big head, uh, that's a typical alert that you may want to ensure that, that, that you design, that, that you call for in your design um, uh, pipe joints that, that can take a higher pressure. But by far the greatest change was the LRFD uh, implementation. Uh, it's been coming for a while, and Rick is going to tell you about it, Rick Jenkins. Thanks, Rick. <clears throat> Thanks, Rick. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I want to give a brief overview of the LRFD implementation into the drainage manual. Um, like Rick mentioned, the 2014 drainage manual that was released on January 1st of this year includes the ASTOS LRFD based pipe cover requirements, um, and it's as the Appendix E. Um, it's important to understand that this was a federal mandate. Um, this is not something we come up with here at DOT. This is federal required. Um, a few key items to note on the implement, implementation. Um, the minimum pipe cover control point has changed from the standard index 205. Um, the pipe no longer is measured to the bottom of the roadway base. Instead, it's measured to the pavement. It may be the top of the pavement or the bottom of the pavement. That depends on the scenario. I will go over those scenarios in more detail with the later slides. Um, with, the, with the control point change, a rule was added to Appendix E to prohibit the pipe from being placed in the roadway base layer. Um, previously that wasn't an issue as the control point was measured from the bottom of the base, but now with it measured from the pavement, there are scenarios where the pipe could be placed in the base if there wasn't a requirement to prevent it. Um, also, there were changes to some of the minimum and maximum cover heights. I will discuss this a little more in detail in the upcoming slides as well. Um, I did, did want to let you know we are working on an LRFD webinar in which I will go into much more detail on, on the Appendix E and the differences from the 205 standard index. Um, be looking for that in the near future. Um, okay, here's one of the scenarios I was talking about with the control point. Um, if you look at the pipe on the left, this is for flexible pavement with flexible pipe. When we say flexible pipe here, we're talking about either plastic or metal pipes. Um, if you look here, the minimum pipe cover is measured from the top of the pipe to the bottom of the flexible pavement. Um, if you look on the right side, the, the rigid pavement, the flexible pipes measure, the minimum cover of the flexible pipes measure from the top of the pipe to the top of the pavement. Um, these diagrams are located throughout Appendix E. As we know, this is a big change from the 205 standard. Now, let's, now we're going to look at the rigid pipe, which is concrete pipe. Um, if you look at the one on the left, this is actually opposite of the flexible pipe. The minimum cover height is measured from the top of the rigid pipe to the top of the flexible pavement. And with rigid pavements measured from the bottom of the rigid pavement to the top of the rigid pipe. Um, I, I did want to mention the maximum cover 
control point did not change from the 205 standard index. It's still measured from the finished grade to the top of the pipe. Now I'll go, some, go through some of the maximum and minimum pipe cover changes. Um, the first one's minimum cover may actually be reduced to the new control point. Um, with the minimum cover being measured from the pavement instead of the base, there, there are cases where the pipes can be placed directly adjacent to the base per LRFD criteria. That's the reason we added the, the requirement to prevent it from being placed in the base. Um, due to the LRFD criteria, most cover heights for concrete pipes were actually reduced. This could reduce in higher class of pipe being required in certain situations. Um, Maximum cover height for the PVC increased from 17 feet to 40 plus feet. Um, this could allow for additional application of the pipe. Um, we've always known that PVC, the 17 feet was probably low for PVC, and this just backed up what we were thinking. Um, the maximum cover height for the polyethylene pipe reduced slightly from the 205 standard index cover height tables. Um, the minimum, minimum covers are very compared comparable to the 205 index. Um, polypropy polypropylene was added, pipe was added to the new appendix E in the 2014 drainage manual. Um, these values are very similar to the HDPE. Um, this pipe was just added, was just approved for the 100 year service life as well. Um, metal pipes have similar maximum and minimum cover heights based on the LRFD criteria. Um, there were some some increases, some decreases, but nothing was dramatic. As a result of the new criteria, we did we did uh, upgrade the culvert service life estimator. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the culvert ser service life estimator. The new version was updated to use the ASHO LRFD cover heights that we discussed. We also made a few aesthetic changes, including making the structural checkbox larger. It actually pops out now and you can open and close it. Um, polypropylene, I, I just mentioned it was approved for the 100 year service life, but this program still has a maximum service life of 50 years, but we're working on updating that now. Right, and the way the way we're handling that in, in current plans is because the polypropylene has uh, the same minimum cover and a slightly greater maximum cover than polyethylene, and comes in the same sizes, um, polyethylene will be used as a surrogate for polypropylene and where polyethylene is allowed, uh, even if it's not mentioned explicitly in the plans, uh, it will be, uh, polypropylene will be allowed. Uh, notice also that the, the little structural check pop out includes an option for whether you have flexible or rigid pavement. Uh, we have to have that be, because of the uh, be, be we have to have that uh, be because of the different ways it's, it's measured. Note also that, that the dimension involved comes from the, in, from the uh, invert of the pipe. And, uh, and the reason we did that is, is that the, the two most known elevations are the finished grade and the pipe invert. And so we, we, we changed that and the program sorts it out internally. Uh, to match the, the, the cover requirements and, and measuring points that Rick showed you previously. But we simply chose the, the two most well-known uh, elevations and, and the idea was to make it, make it easy. Okay. There's one question. Question. Uh, someone asked, what do we mean by South Florida? From Orlando down or from Tampa down? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, I think I earned that one. Um, Fort yeah, it was Fort Lauderdale. There, there was a measurement taken right across from uh, Fort Lauderdale International Airport. I tell you, you guys down there really cook. Uh, you know, uh, pretty. You guys moved pretty good. Uh, Tampa was right up there. Rain and shine. Yeah, right. okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was. Uh, uh, having come from down there, I, I knew folks really, you know, just flew along, and uh, it was confirmed. I'm not going to tell. I'm not going to embarrass anyone, but just. It was uh, well above the speed limit for the average temperature. I mean, average um, uh, speed limit. Okay, that was the only yeah, question. Okay, really? 
Okay, well, um, we have a little bit of extra time. Uh, that'll teach you guys not to ask questions. You'll never do that again. Uh, a couple of issues have, have come up that, that are worthy of, of communication. We had a question come up in, uh, in, in a project in, in D2 uh, where uh, somebody wanted to take a cross strain, and I think it was a small one, like 18 inch or something, and, and they wanted to go more than the, than the 300 feet that's allowed for, for, for storm sewer. The, the, the maintenance access limitations as far as length of pipe, I think it's 300 for 18 inch, 400 for 24, etc. Um, is in the is in the storm sewer section, storm drain section, um, but it really was intended to be for all pipes. And if you think about it, cross drains are typically going to have more more debris than storm sewer anyway. So so we're gonna we're gonna amend that language to you know shut that door uh, for next year. But but you know please, when you're doing cross drains, if you happen to have a long cross drain, which you know is is of course more uh, 300 plus plus foot cross drain is more rare than a 300 foot storm drain but if you happen to have one please provide access um, somewhere in the middle if, if you transgress those lengths that are in there for storm sewer. Also uh, another bit of news uh, last week uh, I was down in Orlando with uh, Dr. Juan Alista, Dr. Harper uh, and others and we were taping a, a computer-based training as part of the BMP uh, trains model. Um, most of you know that whenever we're in a nutrient impaired basin, when we approach uh, environmental resource permitting, uh, we, we have to compute annual loads for pre and post development nutrient loading. The, the burden being to show that we're not increasing the pollutant of concern uh, through the project that we're building. Uh, the BMP trains model is is out there on the UCF website, and uh, it's it's uh, it's still being tinkered with. It's just about final, but there's there's going to be a CVT associated with it that will be available uh, from within the program, and uh, we'll also have it on a website here. You'll you'll hear more about that. Um, but it, it's 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 nice training. Uh, it talks about the different kinds of BMPs whether it's pervious, pervious pavement, a wet pond, stormwater reuse, um, how, to, how to use the model to estimate your loading. And um, then it goes uh, through, there's a number of ex well done example problems. It's, it's pretty good. Jackie and I were down there last week and I think it came out pretty well. And um, uh, so you'll, you'll, hear, you'll be hearing more about that, but it's a nice tool. If you've ever done the nutrient loadings by hand, um, you'll understand why we have a, uh, a, a computer program. There's, uh, there's all kind of interpolation and lookups that this program will do automatically for you. It's, it's a great help. We've got a couple questions. Here. Questions? Yeah. Um, first question is, do we still use RCP when designing cover height for optional materials? As far as utility clearances, I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, yes, we would still do that. That's that's not changed. Nothing's changed for the designer except how the clearances are measured and what those actual clearances are. Um, all 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 the other plans issues uh, are still intact. Um, here's another question. I assume you mean. If the culvert service life estimator is going from the flow line to the pavement, does it automatic, automatically subtract the corrugation? I don't. Rick, do you know that? I, I don't think the corrugations are in there. No, no, it doesn't include the corrugation. <clears throat> Only the pipe, the wall thickness is all it subtracts. The wall thickness for concrete pipe. Yeah, that that has been that way for 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 a long time. Um, you know, one one could argue about that, but it's a uh, uh, we simply continued you know, past past practice. And the next one, okay, sorry. The next question is uh, why is the control point different between flexible pavement and rigid pavement? <laughs> <laughs> Talk to our structural guys. No, um, the the uh, th this the, the 
the way the control points were set up was done by by the structural people. Uh, Ashto. Ashto. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and so um, we we all know that 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 rigid pavement affords uh, more uh, um, spreading of, of the live load. Uh, that's about what the hydraulic engineer is going to tell you. Uh, um, we are trusting that our structural friends have done their homework and have done it right, and um, they simply elected to go this way. I, I do not know the, the, the genesis of, of, the, of the discussions and, and why they did it this way. It, it is more tricky, there's no question. Okay. Uh, in the optional materials table, in the plans, is is RCP still assumed as the designed pipe? If the contractor wants to use a different pipe type, then they would need to recalculate the cover height. Question mark. Well, as as you you would in, in in a pipe design, you would typically have the flow line and the finished grade, and then you would you would simply run the, the culvert service life estimator, and um, and 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 you know decide on your allowable options from that. Uh, RCP is typically shown in, 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 in the plans as far as what's drawn. But the, 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 the plans themselves don't list cover, they list allowable options. Is that it? Um, that's okay. I, I can be done any time. Uh, Off-site inflows. Um, uh, most of you all who were at the last expo know that, that we were in discussions with Water Management District and DEP about off-site inflows. Um, for those of you who didn't get that, uh, our current position as, dis as worked through with DEP and the Water Management Districts is that we, are, we do not anymore need to create bypass system for off-site runoff coming, in, into our, coming towards our highway. Uh, we can take it into our system, provide it that the off that we don't have this condition, that the off-site property is undeveloped, and that we're using an infiltration type BMP, like a retention system. Uh, any other combination of off-site land use and BMP on DOT property, uh, we do not need to upsize our treatment uh, for the system coming in, at least as far as water quality. Uh, and um, we, we do, of course, always have to account for the possibility of upstream flooding and, and the actual flow quantity coming through. Um, we, we, through, through the BMP trans mo trains model, uh, we looked at it, and it, environmentally, it's, it's always beneficial uh, to take an offsite inflow into our system, uh, even if it's much larger, except for that case that, that, that I mentioned with a natural offsite uh, land use and um, an infiltration uh, BMP. In that case, uh, it's going to be a, a, a project-specific calculation and see your district drainage engineer about that. Uh, that's the one case that might not always be uh, environmentally beneficial to uh, incorporate off-site inflows rather, rather than bypass them. So I think that's the news. We have no more questions. Uh, thank you all very much for your attention. And uh, we will uh, hope to see you at the expo or some of the webinars that we're planning. And uh, Jackie may end up telling you uh, more about that either now or, or perhaps in, in future um, advertisements. <laughs>